How'd it go? Yeah. It worked? I think we're there, yeah. Uh-huh. Cool. Hello, Rodney. Well, hello, Dean. Wow. <laughs> so, Rodney, you are a pet nutrition blogger, and uh, for someone who's never heard of you, who exactly are you? Uh, um, what do you do? Yeah, the pet nutrition blogger, no one has any idea what that is. I don't even know what that is, man. It's a term that I coined many years ago, but basically the easiest way to say it is I'm just a pet parent that will take today's information, research, studies. Uh, I get to work because I write for Dogs Naturally Magazine. I'm the editor-at-large over there. I get to work with some of the top experts in the world where I take up-to-date information. I bundle it and package it in very layman terms. I put a really cool visual that I think is cool that people will be able to understand that makes sense with the blog, and yeah. then I shoot it out into the universe for so many people to be able to take it in, to be able to read it and understand it properly. Absolutely. So you've got uh, thousands and thousands of followers. Um, where did they all come from? Yeah, that you is know, insane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that, that's sort of a, a blessing around the message itself. That's how many people today actually care about uh, pet nutrition, longevity, have, wanting their pets to live a really long life. I mean, I am flattered by, you know, the growth of the page. Um, I, I know today there's like hundreds of thousands of likes so many months that, that keep pouring in, which is awesome. But reality is it, it has really nothing to do with uh, who I am exactly, but more aligns the message. People looking for information, everybody's out there today. I mean, look, there's if you look at the here in North America, and I know on your side of the world, it's probably the same thing. The, the birth rate is down by 10% over here in North America because there's more females having uh, puppies and, and dogs and kittens and things like that. So there's more and more demand out there for this type of information. Okay, that's an interesting fact. I didn't know that one. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. So how did you get into all this? You know, yeah, my story is not, is not the best story in the world. I, I've probably told it about a million times. Um, reality is I was your typical dude when I got my first pets. Uh, I would go on TV. I would check through commercials and things like that, uh, looking for the best way to feed my pet. I always thought, like, the best commercials meant the best food. Yeah, and if yeah. I went out into areas and you look on the, on the shelves and you see these big, massive lines of displays, well, geez, that's a big display. It's got to be a good food. It's got to be popular. People are buying it. So unfortunately, I kind of fell into the, the marketing scheme a little bit, and in 2007, 2008, I really hurt my pets with terrible, terrible decisions that I made. So with all of that, you know, Bourne was a, a, a blogger, a, a guy that really just wants to be able to take this information and have people not make the same mistakes that I did. Yeah, well, I think that's how the majority of us get started. I know I did uh, because, yeah, you, you see a big brand and you think, yeah, everyone uses it. It must be good. But... Um, there's just not the information out there about the natural feeding, raw feeding, and everything else. So, like, it's tough to begin if you don't already know someone else who's doing it, isn't it? Absolutely, Dean. You know, you and I, we're actually 4% of the world population, and I, I talk about that all the time. If you were to take everybody in the world uh, who is feeding their pets, it's actually a 4% population of people on the planet that are actually taking the diets into their own hands. So with that 96% that's out there trying to get information like you and I, trying to search and trying to find many years ago, today it's a little bit better, but many years ago, man, it was was scattered and trying to find something really good was super difficult to pin it out. So how did you start off onto uh, better than your average uh, kibble? Like how did you get into raw or fresh food? Yeah, you know, I've got I've got a couple um, I've got a couple idols in my life that uh, that really got the ball rolling for me and and people out there that that I really really owed a lot to. For instance, um, Dogs Naturally magazine was really big for me growing up. I mean, I I would always you know, go running and flocking to that magazine for information. But really, you know, it's kind of like all of us. When 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 something happens or, or something drastic happens, well, the first thing that you do, and I know the first thing I did is I headed to Google and I started punching in words and keywords to find out why that happened to my pet. There are some brilliant writers out there today um, that were writing back then, they, they, you know, little tidbits of information. And, you know, it's kind of a snowball effect. You read one person and that snowball keeps turning. You read another person, you read another person. All that information starts coming in. And that's kind of how I put things together. Mm. Okay. And uh, so how long have you been doing this for? 
You know, I, to be honest with you, I'm going into my, this is probably two and a half years where I've been really uh, taking the time to blog. I'm a terrible writer, so I've been trying to hone my skills a little bit. Yeah. Get me to put together an image, and that is my favorite part of any type of blog that I do. But yeah, it's only been two and a half years, two short-lived years, but I, I tell you, I feel like I've been doing it now for a hundred because of, you know, the people that I get to work with and all the data that's coming in day and night. Not a lot of us sleep when we're looking for data. Absolutely. And uh, it. I wouldn't have said uh, two and a half years just looking at your success so far. So uh, well done there. That's awesome. <laughs> so uh, what do you feed your own dogs then? Uh, so my dogs, you know, I there's my dogs get a complexity of foods today. You know, back in the when I would start, uh, you know, I've probably been raw feeding now for probably about four years. Uh, in the olden days, I was I was doing a lot of home prep, a lot of cooking. So I had a sink full of like pots and pans and a refrigerator full of like different uh, Ziploc bags and containers. Um, when I started to evolve uh, today, uh, my dogs get a variation of food. So uh, first and foremost, I'm a raw feeder, of course. Yeah. Um, but I do understand how food works today, and I get to work with a lot of people. I know that the planet is changing drastically, so our food sources are changing drastically. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm researching today on different types of ads and additions and things that I can bring into the diet to balance those things out. So, of course, a lot of organically sourced uh, sprouted vegetables, things that are local, things that are fresh, things that are packed with bioavailable nutrients, um, and, and just – you know, a whole different type of complexity of herbs that I've been researching. I try not to throw it all in the bowl at the same time. It's hard not to when you know everything is so awesome. Sure. Um, homeopath Julianne Lee, who's like a brilliant teacher of mine, will always tell me to pulse my vegetables or pulse my herbs and six weeks on, six weeks off and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I, I mix a lot of things into that bowl. And I guess as you go, you as you learn, you're continuously adapting and evolving the diet, are you? Absolutely, man. You know, um, I've been learning a lot to be very proactive. And so because a lot of veterinarians today, uh, usually as pet parents, when our dog gets sick, that's the only time we ever want to enter the vet. And I get it. Nobody likes to go there. The dog hates to go there. You hate to go there. It's always a, a weird type of energy. But, you know, things sort of shift and change when you want to be a little bit proactive. So today when I go visit my veterinarian and I take my guys in, I'm going in to do tests like vitamin D tests, um, I'm doing I, uh, Dr. Gene Dodds or NutriScan tests just to see if my dogs have built any type of intolerances. Um, I've done like folate tests and just to make sure that everything is on par under that hood because look, you go and you buy this brand new car and you drive it around for four or five years, you don't really know what's going on under that hood unless you're getting things tested, getting the oils checked and things like that. I don't want anything to break in my dogs and sure. then go and try to fix a problem. So would you recommend your average dog owner do this as well? Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, You know, it's when you break something, it is really, really tough to try to get yourself recovered. Look, we know today that the cancer rate's one in two dogs. I mean, cancer is booming. In fact, I'm reading studies now in research that is saying that the dog has the highest rate of cancer out of any other type of species or breed on the planet. That is saying something right there in itself. Mm. So you don't want to wait till you wake up one morning and there's this big giant lump on the side of your dog and you're like, oh, man, why didn't, you know, of course, I mean, I can't urge enough people out there to be proactive. Take a dollar every day and, you know, skip out a little bit on that coffee or maybe instead of getting that big giant coffee, get a medium one. Put a dollar in a pot. It adds up to 365 bucks a year. Go in at the end of the year and be proactive with your pets. Sure. If there was just one thing you could do, um, what would it be? So obviously people can't do all of these tests because it costs a lot of money and uh, it's difficult for the average owner. So yeah, yeah, what, no, no. If there's one thing, what, what would you say you could well, do? Well, yeah, and then that's a, that's a tough one, man. That <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to put you on the spot. Yeah, actually, yeah, you did put me on the spot there very well. <laughs> you know, I guess I, I'm, I'm a big fan. I mean, I just started to do uh, Dr. Gene Dodds's uh, NutriScan test. Yeah. Um, yeah. For me, that one, you know, and I'm sure there's a lot of tests out there that are very important, but this one in itself, the reason why I'm a fan of this one, this one will show you into tolerances that you have no idea that are occurring. I've got three dogs. I've got these two beautiful, healthy dogs, except for my girl, Sammy, that I fed the jerky to many years ago, and I won't get into that story. But my, my gorgeous two healthy dogs who have never had, knock on wood, any problems at all. Those guys, I just randomly did a NutriScan test, and I got back these results of these things that they had intolerances to that I had no idea. And so when you're feeding these things to your animal and you're building up small, minute pieces of uh, inflammation that are slowly growing and, and then become rapidly growing and then you get a breakdown, I love that test. I really did fall in love with that test. I guess it would just compound and compound and suddenly absolutely, problem. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So going back to one in two dogs have cancer or can get cancer, what's the number one cause of this? 
Well, yeah, and I really, I, it would be awesome if anybody knew the answer to that. I mean, I'm sure, I, you know, in my opinion, there's a whole complexity to cancer in the way it works, right? Mm. We know today through research that uh, 5% of cancer is actually genetic because we always think it's genetic. We know that 95% is affected through diet and lifestyle change in itself. So that is where I like to focus all of my attention on. I can't change the 5%, but I can change the 95% aspect of that. So for me, it, you know, it's really important, you know, what, where am I sourcing my foods from for my animals? Um, my backyard, what does my backyard look like? Am I putting fertilizer down in my backyard? Am I affecting my dogs with toxins and pesticides and larvicides and fungicides? So, I mean, of course, this would be a debate, uh, Dean, that would probably go on until doomsday. Yeah. But to, if I had to narrow it down, focus on that 95% diet and lifestyle. And, you know, of course, it's a very broad category. But if you can focus on that 95% rather than say, oh, you know what, it's genetic and think of that 5%, you'd be losing out. Sure. So say you came across a dog owner who feeds cable and has just heard about raw feeding and wants to get started. Where would you stick them? Like, What, what would you tell them? Yeah, you know, and that's a scary place. It's a scary place for a lot of people. It was a scary place for me. You know, when you when you ha when you're uh, let's say feeding a process s type of food, and the manufacturer has been making your food forever, and they've been feeding your pet forever, and then all of a sudden you're saying, "Hey, you take charge." Mm. That is a big step for a lot of people, especially yeah. dudes, man. Look, I'll tell you today, I, 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 you know, I work in this industry, and I can tell from my social media page, ninety percent of of these people that are interactive are females. Mm -hmm. I mean, reality is my mom fed me, my dad didn't feed me, so, you know, females are very nurturing. God bless all of them, the most beautiful creatures in the world, and they're the, usually the ones that will step up and be brave and take charge. Yeah. Dudes yeah. like us, man, it takes a little bit to get us going and get us riling, right? I mean, nor, but, you know, when you can just step back and do something small. So when a kibble feeder will approach me and a kibble feeder will say to me, look, I, I want to do something, but I'm not exactly sure, you know, where to go, what to do, how to start a teaspoon. A simple teaspoon to show them that your dog is not going to die if you took a teaspoon of, let's say, some raw food or some fresh meat, something ethically raised, organic, and yep. you put it in that bowl, just one teaspoon of something raw in that bowl, take out a teaspoon of something processed, that's one less teaspoon of something bad in that bowl. That is always the best way to start for people. I try to get them, engage them in that. And then of course I tell them to I tell I send them to places. Like there's some beautiful social media pages out there that can take over from that point. Sure. You often hear about the myth of feeding kibble and raw together. Now, uh, I'm not too convinced myself, but what's your opinion? You know, that, yeah, that one, that one I like to leave for like, a lot of the scientists out there. I know people sure. will dwell on that one and be like, you know, there's difference in processing and, there, and, and there's different ways and how it digests and this could affect this and this could affect that. You know, if we focus on that too much, you, you know, we're talking 4% of the population of the raw feeding, 96 aren't. You, we're going to scare a lot of the 96% of that world population out there. I, I, I don't think, just to give you an example, if you had a bowl of kibble, there was a study released in 2005, I talk about it all the time, but if you had a bowl of kibble and you were to add veggies, fresh vegetables on top of that kibble three times a day, uh, yep. excuse me, three times a week, just three times a week, you would put a little bit of fresh vegetables onto a bowl of kibble. If I was worried about the processing, of let's say raw fresh foods, whether they be vegetables or whether they be meat, I would be losing out. Why? Because the study shows that if you were to put raw vegetables hypothetically onto a bowl of kibble, you would reduce the rate of bladder cancer by 90%. That's crazy, isn't it? That in itself tells me I'm not going to worry about that so much. Let me worry about transitioning off of processed and getting myself onto fresh. So if somebody, somebody's going to be feeding a little bit of process with a little bit of fresh in the bowl and their overall goal is to get to the fresh side of things, I'm not dwelling too much on that. Okay, so um, you mentioned fresh uh, fruit and veg quite a bit. So you can't get away with just meat these days then? You know, it's what a, what a topic that is. I mean, reality is I know a lot of prey model folk out there. You know, I've got a lot of supporters that are prey model. Some of them uh, have jumped ship because of the second I mentioned a vegetable, they're gone. But I've never, you know, it's really hard to explain something in a blog. Yeah. What we know today is that, of course, the planet is changing rapidly and meat is changing rapidly. You know, a lot of these people, a lot of these experts that wrote their books on prey model books and how to feed your animals back in the 80s, back in the 90s, food was different back then. You know, today, 50% of the planet is owned and consumed by livestock. 50% mm -hmm. of the planet has livestock on it. 
150 billion animals a year we slaughter. There's 7 billion people on the planet. So 7 billion people means we've got this much food ration, but how do you feed the other 150 billion animals? You have to grow crops rapidly. You've got corn being grown. You've got soy being grown. These things are growing rapidly on our planet to be able to feed all this livestock that ultimately we're going to eat at the end of the day. We've done research. We've seen that from 1950 to 1999, the USDA published studies that showed that in 50 years, these foods that are grown in these soils have depleted by 50%. And then we feed it to our animals. And then we eat, consume those animals. So food is rapidly degrading. So it was really awesome to see what the NCHS in Chicago this year, Steve Brown got on camera and he showed the difference between wild game and factory farmed animals. And the yeah. difference, in, it wasn't even close, Dean. It wasn't even close. So if we think that we're just going to take a bowl, fire inside of it, 80% meat, 10% bone, 10% organ, and sit back and sprinkle a little bit of kelp on it and say, okay, we're good, and we're going to feed this forever for our dogs, you're going to have a rude awakening, man. I promise you. And that is because the planet is changing. Sure. So uh, what's the best way to counteract this then? Like, but how, how can you stay one step ahead? Absolutely. Variation, moderation, and balance. You know, that, that was the kind of the thing this year, the, the big theme in Chicago was, by Steve Brown was trying to show people different complexities and things you can add in the diet. So, you know, every time I, I talk to those guys, they're bringing up things like ma manganese, iodine, vitamin D, vitamin E, uh, zinc, omega-3. Like, where are you getting these sources from? I, and here I am sitting beside Steve Brown. He nudges me. He's like, dude, where are you getting your iodine from? And I'm like, uh, my food. And he's like, what are you adding? And I'm like, I'm adding kelp. Well, how do you know how much iodine is in your kelp? Well, I buy it in the farmer's market. It's got to be clean. It's got to be good, right? Have you got it tested? Uh, no. Then you don't know what's in it. And he's right. It's good Reality point, yeah. is, yeah, so if I just sat there and I relied on one thing that I was buying all the time to be able to supplement it for my dogs, maybe one of my dogs is absorbing it. Maybe the other one isn't. How do I know? So when you vary things, right? So today, for instance, on the topic of iodine, I'll switch between like organic nori or I'll use uh, spirulina blue green algae, sea vegetables, uh, cranberries, organic cranberries have iodine, not a lot, but they do have some in it. So it's about rotating through foods um, and not thinking about balance every single day because no, of course, I mean, we don't eat balanced every single day, but it's balanced That's over that. time, over an extended period. You want to make sure that you're just not missing on something to cause disease on the back end. So can you balance that over, say, a week, a month, or even like a year with by feeding seasonal fruit and veg? Yeah, and that's, you know, that is an awesome question. I mean, I, and I, I wish I had all the detail and the data on that, and that is why I tell everybody to be proactive with your veterinarian. That is a question that I would love answered and you would love answered because if we had it right, if we know that we could just put it in a bowl, the dog had absolutely everything it needed for the rest of its life, we would be eating that way, and you would be eating that way. It's just not possible. It's just not possible. No. We don't know everything about nutrition. If somebody comes out today and they tell you, I know it all, I know everything, this is exactly how it, it should be done, man, they got rocks in their head. Data is changing every single day. And the only way that you can st stay on top of the game is you got to be willing to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Sure. So it does have to be raw, or can it be cooked or steamed? or? Well, I, yeah, you know, that... There, there's another huge debate in itself. I mean, yeah. look, I try not to focus on, 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 on sort of the massive aspect of it. I love feeding my fresh food. I love feeding healthy, clean food. And then, of course, heat, we know. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that heat, is, of course, is going to destroy nutrients. Yeah. I feed, I puree my vegetables raw for my guys. Why? Because when I looked at the data from the USDA and I saw that food was depleted by 50% of its nutritional value, why on earth am I going to cook it? and destroy the other 50% yeah. of it, right? So that's me. That's my perspective. I know a lot of people out there, they might have immunocompromised children there or immunocompromised uh, people within that household. They have to lightly cook some of their foods to avoid the bacteria, pathogen loads. Good on them. Just start, start with minimally processed. So if you're feeding kibble and then you can get yourself to a can, even better. It's less processed. You can get yourself to a dehydrated, even better. You get yourself to something raw or lightly cooked, it's in stages. So it's all going up the scale. Absolutely, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And uh, so you've got a shop over there in Nova Scotia, is that right? I've got a shop, yeah. Awesome. You know what? I do have a shop over. Not too many people know that I have a shop over here in Nova Scotia, but it's basically my visual center for all my blogs. So when I started and people are like, what the heck are you talking about? You're telling me about this turmeric. What, what is that? Milk thistle. I have no idea what these things are. So I built this little tiny shop, this visual center where, you know, all my madness can be in there when people <laughs> need to come in and find some of these things. Okay. So uh, you're in there yourself, are you? Or do you have someone running it? 
Uh, you know what? I have a beautiful, beautiful staff. Uh, well, one of these wonderful girls, Mandy, my manager, she's going to kill me for mentioning her. But I have this beautiful, beautiful staff because today, unfortunately, I do travel a lot. I do work a lot. I do write a lot. So I only get to go in there so many times a week if, if I do yeah. get an opportunity to go in there. But no, I mean, I've got beautiful people taking care of it for me. I imagine you'd have lines of people asking questions as well. Well, yeah, that's a, <laughs> yeah, that's another thing in itself, believe me. Awesome. So uh, you mentioned all your uh, the graphics that you do. You do them all yourself, do you? I do. You know what? I just uh, Karen laughs at me when I say this, but yeah, I'm just. I, I said it on her show. I'm just this dude that fiddles around in his basement, man. Like literally, um, I will spend weeks upon weeks, and people will see me, and I'll be like staring up into the ceiling like a zombie. You know, photo is a thousand words, and so mm-hmm. how can I try to give my message to you? You know, today on social media, unfortunately, 500 words, 600 words, you go over that, you lose people very quickly. It's really hard to keep people engaged. Dean, yeah. you know as a blogger, man, if you start writing too much, people tune out, zone out, and they are gone. How can I give you another 500 words with just an image? And so that's what I focus a lot of my attention on is trying to grasp people's attention through images. Yeah, well, it's definitely working. Like your images are probably some of the best on Facebook. They're, they're <laughs> amazing. Believe me, I've lost. I I probably aged ten years because of them. Yeah, I'm not surprised. They're very consistent too, which is uh, that's, that's the thing that counts. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Awesome. So, uh, how can we make our dogs live forever then? Like that. That's you're coming to the UK in December for the Natural Dog Conference. I am. And uh, your your talk is called the Journey to Longevity. And uh, yeah, what, what's it all about? Well, you know, the journey to longevity is, is basically, it's my story. It's, it's where I started and, and where I am today. Dean, I, I'm, I'm blessed because I'm a pet owner like you. I, there's a lot of brilliant people out there and a lot of experts out there. Today, you'll see in my work, I'm starting to think on my own and I'm starting to put my philosophies into things. But when I come to the UK, I want to be able to bring all the data that I've collected to help give people a different aspect on things. Look, take some of the top doctors in the world. Take Dr. Ian Billinghurst. Take Dr. Gene, uh, Gene Dodds, if you don't know them. One will tell you to feed functional foods. It's okay to feed grains and things like that. The other one will tell you, hey, if you feed your dog grains, you're going to age him rapidly and you're going to cause a lot of problems. Sure. Two brilliant doctors, two different philosophies. You know, yeah. you look at Dr. Peter Tobias and writes for Dogs Nashi Magazine. Don't give your dogs fish. If you feed fish, it's toxic today. It's full of metals. It's going to hurt your animal. Look on the other side. you got people like Steve Brown who say, no, you have to add fish. Where are you going to get your vitamin D3 and all these other different things from in your food. So there's a lot of information, brilliant people with different views that clash. And for pet owners, it's like your brain exploding all over your monitor because you have no idea what to do. So I want to be able to come and be able to show these people, here's some of the things I collected, here's some of the brilliant people that I got to sit with, and take a look at some of the ideas and maybe a different point of view on how we will be able to extend the longevity. Look, you guys had one of the oldest dogs that lived there, Bramble, that lived to be 27 um, in your country. Mm. Today, the average lifespan for the dog in North America is 10.3 years. That is not long enough for me. I want my dog to be able to longer. There's a dog named Chilla in Australia that lived to be 32. Yes, genetics have an involvement in it, but if we know anything about nutrigenomics, we know that we affect the genes by how we treat them with through lifestyle and through diet. So I want to be able to give a little bit of that input to the people of the UK. So you're going to teach us how to take a bit from this person, a bit from that person, Absolutely. and uh, pick all the right information yeah, abs- and make the best abs- informed decision for your dog. Absolutely. These doctors, yeah. I'm blessed today, they will message me all the time. They will email me all the time. They'll send me data. Hey, Rod, look, I tried writing this blog. I really didn't do it. It didn't work. Uh, I can't. I couldn't put it together. People thought it was too much, too scientific, too complex. Hey, could you break it down, make it layman for me and put it out? So I am blessed that way where I get all that up-to-date data. Believe me, my phone does not stop working. Dana Scott from Dogs Natchee Magazine messaged me last night at 3 o'clock in the morning to tell me about new research on vitamin D. So that's kind of how we work in this industry nonstop. You don't sleep. Sure. So uh, if there was – I'm going to start wrapping this up just because I've uh, taken quite a lot of your time this evening. Um, So if there's one thing working for you and your dogs right now, uh, what would this be? You know, just like just like how I how I said it, man, the, the ability to be able to learn, unlearn, and relearn, variation, moderation, and balance, right? Yeah. So it's it's those things, it's putting those things together, it's be able to research foods, rotate through foods, try to feed clean, healthy foods to my animals. Um, I, I I just I I really think that it there's ne- I really wish there was just one 
and, and you just asked me that question, I still couldn't even just give you just one. Variation, moderation, and balance, those are my three sure. keys. I use them a lot in my blogs all the time. I can't stress that enough for pet owners out there. Cool. Okay. So variation, uh, moderation, balance. Absolutely. Var- vary your foods. Try to try to go through different complexity of foods to get different nutrients. We don't know if our animals are absorbing this or if they can absorb that. So why not mix those things into the diet? Moderation. Just don't take it and throw it all in that bowl. I know people all the time that this is good, 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 and they just dump it all into the bowl and they give it to their animal, right? Yeah. Break those things down, right? Uh, and then balance. Balance over time, right? You want to make sure, am I giving my dog calcium? I know people that will fry up ground beef and throw carrots in there and rice and they give it to their dog and they're like, there you go, I give you everything you need. Where's your calcium coming from, right? So, of course, balance is important as well. Absolutely. Right, so when you're over here in the UK, um, what else do you plan to do? Do you plan to... uh, to go uh, see the sights. I am yeah, so excited, man. Like yeah. I know big a big Ben is all is all that we ever see here in Canada. You know, Canada is very close because of course you guys came over here and colonized it for us, so we're very <laughs> similar to the United Kingdom, but I, you know, I've heard about your fish and chips down in the UK. I heard it's like the best fish and chips on the planet. Absolutely. So I am super excited about that. I mean, I, I lo- listen my favorite food in the world, even though people are going to laugh at me, are sandwiches. And I heard you guys make delicious sandwiches down there. So I'm, I'm you know what, I'm a food guy. So I, I'm probably going to attack every single restaurant that you guys have down there. Awesome. awesome. So you've not awesome. been here before? I've never, I've never, you know, I've only, I've connected through Heathrow and I've been flying around the world, but I've never gotten outside the airport and gone in there. But man, I heard it's, it is a beautiful place. Well, you have to uh, wait and see, won't you? <laughs> I'm super excited, man. <laughs> awesome. So uh, how can people best contact you, say thank you for the interview, and uh, see what yeah. you do? Yeah, Dean, you know, I, I, I have to say this, and I, you know, uh, so I get a lot of messages, and yeah. God bless everybody out there. Thank you so much for supporting me. Thank you for helping push me along my cause and spreading my message. Uh, you know, um, my Facebook, my personal page got maxed out. Facebook, unfortunately, will only let me have so many friends. So It, it took a while for me to get in that list. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then I built a personal page that that uh, uh, pet nutrition blogger Rodney Habib that's maxed out, not maxed out, sorry, but so many messages. And then, of course, I got my plan apart. So I got three pages. Um, when Facebook messaged me and gave me the analytics on that, I get about four hundred to five hundred thousand messages a week. I can't keep up, so I'm so sorry, but I got beautiful supporters who will help answer each other's questions on there. My Facebook page is packed with doctors, experts, nutritionists from all around the world who jump in and help. So. I promise I'll get to them as much as I can. Keep sending them. I'll try to read them. And I'm coming down to the UK, man, to meet people one-on-one and, and be able to hug people and shake hands, and I'm really excited about that. So uh, you'll be in UK 5th and 6th of December at the Natural Dog Conference uh, run by myself and Caroline Griffith. So we look forward to seeing you there. And, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pick you up from the airport with Karen, shall I? <laughs> yes, man. I'm coming. We're going to be coming down uh, some a couple of days early to be able to go check out the scenes and everything. I am so excited. You have some beautiful, wonderful speakers that are all going to be there. I've been doing some research on all of them, some brilliant people that I want to sit down in a room with and grill with them, grill their brains, and get some information from them. I'm sure they want to do the same to you as well. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time, Rodney. I appreciate all that. Right, Thanks so much for having me, and I'll see you guys soon. We'll see you soon. Cheers. Here, let me, while it's recording, can you see my phone now? Hold on. Hey, dear, what happened there? Do you see that nice crap? Hold on, maybe if I turn off my screen, it's even better. You see, there you go. Can you see that? Yep, sure can. Yeah, that's Dr. Karen Becker. <laughs> what did she do? Uh, well, next time you talk to her, ask her. Say, hey, what did you do to uh, Rod's phone? There you go. Right nice there, time. Chicago, live. All right, let me move my mic up here in the front so you can hear me better. What mic you got? I got a Yeti. Ah, see? Uh, there you go, brother. And oh, you got a filter on the you got a little puffball. Yes.